We continue in our series as part of God's big story uh, of celebrating the resurrection and the people who met the risen Jesus. And today we look at Thomas, how he put his doubts aside to embrace the wonder and the joy of Jesus, his risen King. Good morning. Today's reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. It was late that Sunday evening and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Then Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. After saying this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy at seeing the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Thomas said to them, Unless I see the scars off the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Then stretch out your own hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you see me? How happy are those who believe without seeing me? In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles, which are not written down in this book, but these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. Amen. I've been reading a book that my elder son gave me. It's the story of Paul Kalantiiti, whose parents came from India, but he was born in the United States. He trained in medicine at Yale University and became a brain surgeon, one of the most demanding tasks in the field of medicine. He worked hard and did very well, eventually becoming a senior consultant, well on the way to becoming a professor. In preparation for teaching, he was encouraged to do a further course of study, and he did so under the tutelage of a well-known scientist, a professor of electrical engineering and neurobiology. Paul Kalaniti describes the scientist as one who was honest, self-effacing, and who cared deeply about people. During the year that the brain surgeon studied under him, the scientist became ill and was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He sought the help and support of the brain surgeon and asked him, do you think my life has any meaning? Have I achieved anything worthwhile in my life? The man was plunged into a heart-wrenching review of his life and was filled with self-doubt. Many people these days have doubts about their own lives, what they've achieved, or doubts about their faith. Does God really know me and care about me? Does he really listen when I pray? Thomas is one of my favourite disciples because I feel that I can identify with him. He was the doubter, or perhaps he wasn't willing to just take other people's word for things. He wanted to be really sure before he accepted something as true. On the evening of the first Easter day, Jesus entered the upper room, despite the locked doors, and revealed himself to the disciples. But, when Tom, uh, but Thomas hadn't been there that evening. So when the other disciples told him, he wasn't inclined to believe them. Rubbish, he said. I know Jesus died. I saw where he was laid in the tomb. You can't tell me that somehow I was mistaken. 
or that he's got up again? No, nope, I don't believe you. The only thing that will convince me is if I see Jesus for myself and I'm not going to be hoodwinked by some ghost or another person impersonating him. I want proof. That means I want to see the scars of the nail prints in his hands and I want to see and touch the place where the centurion pierced his side. Short of that, I just can't believe what you say. John included two other incidents from Thomas's life in his gospel to help us build a, a better picture of his character. In John chapter 11, when Jesus received word of Lazarus's illness and announced that he would go to visit him in Bethany, the other disciples were redu reluctant to travel so close to Jerusalem and the danger that was there from the Jewish leaders. But Thomas showed his commitment to Jesus and his courage when he said to the others, let's all go along with the teacher that we may die with him. Now that might have been over pessimistic about the danger that lay in Bethany and a visit to the home of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, but what commitment he showed. He was ready apparently to go with Jesus and die with him if need be. In the second instant, uh, when Jesus taught the disciples in the upper room that he was soon to leave them, it was Thomas that asked where he was going and by what way. He wasn't prepared just to accept the general word. He wanted to know in detail. And Jesus' answer was, I am the way, the truth and the life. A week after Jesus' resurrection, he met them again in, with the disciples. And this time, Thomas was present. Jesus invited Thomas to come forward and see the wounds and touch his side. Let's just stop there for a moment. I make a few observations of what this incident teaches us. First, we learn that Jesus knows what we say to one another. It isn't only when we address our concerns to God in prayer that he listens, but to all that we say. Indeed, all that we think is open to Jesus as a book might be. He is aware of our words and our thoughts. Now that ought in one sense to encourage us, yet in another way to act as a warning. The encouragement is that Jesus is by our sides at all times. He knows where we are. He knows our concerns, our fears. He knows where we're in danger. He knows when we're ill and in need of his help. So don't fear. As a direct result of the resurrection, Jesus is with us at all times. That ought to reassure us and encourage our faith and trust in him. But it's also a warning. Jesus hears all that we say and knows all that we think. So we should guard our thoughts and our words. Ask yourself, how would I feel if Jesus were physically here listening to my conversation? Would I say the same things? Or if my thoughts were somehow displayed on a screen for all to see, would I not be more cautious and less critical of others? Jesus hears and knows our thoughts and words. The second observation, this passage teaches us about the nature of the resurrection body of Jesus. Yes, he was able to pass through locked doors, but it was still a recognisable body. The wounds of the nail prints and the spear were still visible. Jesus invited Thomas to come and see, test out the reality of who he was and what his body looked like. It was the wounds in his hands that were proof. Although certain changes must have taken place in the body of Jesus, for it's now an eternal or spiritual body that knows no decay or change, yet he was clearly still recognisable. And the Bible asserts that when we die and are taken to heaven, we shall know him, or we shall see him as he is. The third observation, how do we deal with our doubts? Now, some people don't ever seem to have any doubts. To them, faith is a straightforward matter 
and all that they hear makes sense and they receive it and welcome it. But I suspect that most of us are a bit more complicated than that. We don't always know how to understand some of the things that the Bible says or some areas of Christian doctrine. It isn't that we reject what we're taught, but we're not 100% sure what it means or how to understand it. What is God really like? Does God really hear my prayers? And what if they aren't answered in the way I expect? How should I cope with that? In this, Thomas gives us an example. He was honest enough to admit his doubts and he was willing to have them answered. <coughs> so if we have doubts or, or are unsure about something, there are several things that we can do. First, confront your doubts. Don't bury them away and try to forget about them. Then we can pray about them. Tell God that you're unsure and ask him to guide you into trust. Then we can study the matter. Read what the Bible actually says about this issue. Weigh up what it means. Read a book that offers advice or gives help on what the issue is really about. A Bible dictionary or, or a book that explains faith can be very helpful. Now, let's return to the story. Jesus invited Thomas to come and see and touch him. Whether he actually did, we're not told. At the sight of Jesus, all his doubts seemed to have vanished, and Thomas was utterly convinced of the truth that it was Jesus. He gives us an additional proof of the reality of the resurrection. Even a doubter was convinced. Personally, I picture Thomas as dropping to his knees at this point. The words of response or commitment and worship that he uttered are so special. My Lord and my God. These are some of the most profound words of the four Gospels. Prior to this, no one is recorded as having spoken of Jesus as God. It really seems that Thomas was utterly convinced. Indeed, he recognised Jesus' divinity. I wonder if during the week that had passed, he'd been thinking about the possibility that Jesus might actually have risen from the dead. Suppose the other disciples were right, and they really had seen Jesus. What would that mean? I suspect that these kind of thoughts may have gone through Thomas's mind, and he would have said to himself, if Jesus really is alive, if he's risen from the dead, then he's no ordinary man. I've had my suspicions when I saw the miracles he performed and when I saw, uh, when I heard him say those words, your sins are forgiven. If he's really alive again, why he has conquered death and no ordinary man could do that. He must be God come in human form. Thomas took his, these thoughts one stage further. If Jesus really is risen from the dead, then we must give him our total commitment and worship. He deserves nothing less. Hence Thomas's amazing words. They're words of worship and Jesus accepted them as such. C.T. Studd, the founder of WEC, the large missionary society, took as his motto for life, if Jesus Christ is God, and if he died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Now, how does all this relate to us today? Why, does it not show that Christians are called to offer Jesus our worship, commitment and service? When we sing songs of adoration and worship to Jesus, do we really mean them? When these songs describe Jesus as Lord and Master, do they come from our hearts? The church exists by virtue of the Easter message. We are res resurrection people and our task is to come apart to worship, but also to engage with our neighbours and friends, to witness to this message to share with them the good news of Jesus. Thomas was saying that being a follower of Jesus 
would take a hundred percent guts, time, energy, and strength. If you're a Christian, really mean it. As many of you know, I've been able to make several visits back to East Asia, where I had worked as a missionary for 14 years back in the 1960s and 70s. Over the years, a number of Christians in Laos have been sent to re-education camps or prison because of their Christian faith. We've been able to speak to a number who have spent a year, two years or even more in prison with very little food in unhygienic uh, conditions and suffering beatings. Today, the Christian church in Laos is stronger than when we worked there. Their worship is vibrant and the number of Christians must be four, five or even more times as many as in the 1970s. It's the resurrection of Jesus that has given them such strength and courage. They know that Jesus is alive for they experience his love, support and gift of inner strength. They live with boldness and hope that they too will be raised to eternal life with Christ in heaven. So let's follow in their footsteps and be inspired by their example and the example of Thomas. Let's continue to serve God with all our skills and energies, with all our faith, love and commitment. Let's believe in the resurrection and trust in our risen Lord. God will surely bless our work and witness and continue to pour his spirit upon us all. Amen.